Mr. President, it is my pleasure to present to you Mr. John F. Fish to receive the honorary degree of Doctor of Business Administration. Stand over here. Over where? Right here. Okay. John F. Fish, we are both pleased and proud to recognize you today for your exceptional leadership in the business and philanthropic communities. You not only shaped the skylines and economies of Boston and other major cities through Suffolk, you strengthen communities and create transformative opportunities for young people to build successful lives through your extensive civic and philanthropic efforts. To you, that is perhaps the most important building you do. You are recognized nationally as a highly accomplished business owner and executive who has grown Suffolk into one of the largest, most successful, most innovative private building contractors in our nation. Suffolk is continually revolutionizing the industry by building smart and applying cutting edge technologies to some of the most complex, high profile building projects in the world today. In fact, you have transformed Suffolk into a technology company. A prominent leader in our business and civic, and civic community, you are tireless, as proven by the number of important service roles you have taken on. You are the founder and former chair of the Massachusetts Competitive Partnership which champions educational opportunity as a means to grow our economy. You are the former board chair of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. Today, you serve as the board chair of Brigham and Women's Hospital and sit on the executive committee of Partners Healthcare. Among the region's most respected civic leaders and philanthropists, you demonstrate a tremendous and ongoing commitment to transforming the lives of young people through education. By envisioning and founding scholar athletes, you are helping to close the opportunity gap for thousands of young people in grades 9 through 12 across the Commonwealth. Scholar-athletes achieves its noble and important goals by leveraging the power of athletics and wellness to create the discipline, confidence, and social-emotional skills needed to support success both in school and in life. As a proud graduate of Bowdoin College with a bachelor's degree in political science, you are committed to higher education. You currently serve on the executive committee of the Board of Trustees of Boston College, and you are the only non-graduate of that institution to ever serve as its Board of Trustees chair. John Fish, as a person who selflessly applies their success and opportunity to, improve, to improving the lives of others and to providing leadership in our civic and business endeavors, you stand before us today as a model citizen and as a role model for your fellow graduates today. On this day, May 19, 2019, we are humbled to honor you and hear your inspirational message to your fellow graduates. As we celebrate commencement and you become an alumna of Curry College, as a member of the class of 2019, we proudly and appropriately honor you. John F. Fish, 
by action of Curry College, the Board of Trustees concurring, and by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Regents of Higher Education of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I hereby compare, confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Business Administration, honoris causa, and admit you to all the rights and privileges thereunto pertaining. Congratulations, Dr. Fish. Ladies and gentlemen, I now call upon Curry's newest alum, Dr. John Fish, to deliver the 2019 commencement address. Thank you, President Quigley. I'm honored and privileged to be with you today. Before I begin, I'd like to recognize President Ken Quigley for the tremendous job that he has done at Curry College since he first assumed the role of president in 1996. It was Ken's clear vision, strong leadership, and sense of purpose that helped lift the standing of this wonderful institution to new heights and made Curry College one of the most respected schools in all of New England. Congratulations and thank you to Ken, his wife Beth, his secret weapon, and his entire family for the sacrifices they have made for Curry and their continued commitment to the future success of this school and its students. I would also like to thank the Curry College alumni, staff, and teachers. Without all of you, this day would not be possible. And thank you to the parents of the graduates. I now would ask the graduates to please stand, please stand, and turn and give your parents a warm round of applause. Please sit. And finally, and most importantly, congratulations to the graduates of Curry College Class of 2019. For 30 years, I lived in Milton, just a stone's throw from Curry College. And I would often walk there from my home with my wife and daughters. We would admire the beautiful campus, would watch the sporting events, would have the opportunity to talk to the students. So needless to say, I was very comfortable speaking with you today. But when I was a student, I wasn't comfortable speaking in front of anybody. And I could never imagine myself someday standing at a podium in front of a large audience like this and reading a speech. Because, honestly, I couldn't read at all. I have a learning difference, dyslexia that wasn't understood until my later years in high school. And at that time, I couldn't spell past the third grade, and no one could read my handwriting. I knew something was wrong. Today, Curry College has some of the best programs for diverse learners in the country. So I know some of you sitting out there this morning have the same challenges with reading and writing as I do. The letters, 
the numbers and the punctuation get scrambled on the page. Your brain plays tricks on you. In fact, sometimes when I read speeches, I get lost and I can't find where I am. So buckle your seatbelts. <laughs> I used to remember my days back in elementary school, hiding in the back row, looking down at my desk, and avoiding eye contact with my teacher because I was scared to be called to the board. I was so afraid to fail. Schoolwork was a grind. Actually, that's an understatement. For me, schoolwork was a nightmare. I remember reading of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck in ninth grade. I had so much trouble getting through each page. It took me forever to finish that book. And at the end of it, I had absolutely no idea what I read. For every book, every assignment, it was much of the same. After a while, my difficulties in school really started to weigh on me. My self-esteem and my confidence suffered. I thought I was stupid and that I wasn't going anywhere. And none of the adults and kids around me seemed to disagree. Because they didn't know the real me. They didn't know that I had unlimited potential. But that my approach was just a little bit different from other kids. And then came Coach Dick Duffy. Coach Duffy was my football coach at Tabor Academy. Coach Duffy saw something in me that others couldn't see. He saw leadership qualities and problem-solving skills. He saw a work ethic and a passion for winning. He saw me for who I really was. And he loved what he saw. He cared. And at that time in my life, those two things meant everything to me. Because when someone believes in you and loves you, you start to love yourself. And you become more comfortable in your own skin. I started to realize that my dyslexia was a special gift rather than a disability. And that shift in thinking became my launch pad towards a brighter future. Coach Duffy, the one person who loved me for who I was, changed my life forever. Once I realized that, I never looked back. Today, I show him that same love and respect that he showed me. Because I can. Because love is contagious. And because I owe him my life. I never forgot the lessons Coach Duffy taught me at a young age. And that lesson is this. It just takes one person who cares to make a difference. When I consider the people I've been privileged to meet throughout my life, this lesson has been proven true time and time again. I remember the first time I heard of a young woman by the name of Katrina Walters. It was May 2011. I was sitting at my table on a Sunday morning reading the Boston Globe. What I read was an unmistakable underdog story. The article was about a young girl who had fallen on tough times, but she continued to punch above her weight and refused to give up regardless of her circumstances. Katrina had left a horrible family situation at home at 16, and she decided to set out on her own. 
She didn't have any place to live, and she had no money. She often slept in her car. And when she was working 85 hours a week at Taco Bell just to survive, one day, a friend's mother encouraged her to apply to college, and she did, because Katrina was not afraid to fail. And after all, when you're at the bottom, you really have nothing to lose. She applied to UMass Lowell because it seemed like a perfect fit for her. She had a passion for building things and liked the urban feel of the campus and the surrounding communities. She was accepted into UMass and didn't take it for granted. Katrina worked extremely hard and she actually discovered a passion for rowing while at UMass. Crew was a physically grueling team sport that demanded a lot from her, both physically and emotionally. And there was something about the rhythm of rowing on the river that drove her competitiveness to new heights and yet soothed her spirit and provided her with a quiet solitude she had never experienced in her youth. She once said, when I slept in my car, I would look up at the sky and wonder, would life ever be normal for me? When I rode, everything just seemed to fall in place. Katrina eventually graduated from UMass Lowell, ready to take on the world. Because in addition to what she had learned in the classroom, she'd also learned about the importance of grit, persistence, and character during her struggle to survive. I remember reading this article and saying to myself, we need to hire her now. And Suffolk did hire her. And she's been with our company since ever since. Today, Katrina Walter is an assistant superintendent on the massive 1.5 billion Encore Boston Harbor Hotel project in Everett. And when you visit her, <laughs> and when you visit her on the site, you'll find only one thing brighter than her future, her smile. Because someone believed in her, she now believes in herself. Fast forward today, another young woman, Sola Perez. Like Katrina, Sola didn't come from a privileged background. In fact, the odds were pitted, pitted heavily against her. She was raised by a single mom and lived in the Dominican Republic until second grade. Spanish was her primary language. Money was tight and the prospects of attending college distant. But she was determined to make something of herself anyways. Sola was not afraid to be vulnerable. She was not afraid to fail. So she sought help. And while attending Madison Park High School in Boston, she took advantage of the Scholar Athlete Program. Scholar Athlete is a nonprofit I co-founded 10 years ago that helps inner city kids succeed in academics by leveraging school sports. The program serves 5,000 students annually by providing scholarship and zones within their schools. Zones are quiet, safe places where kids can gain support from trained tutors, facilitators who actually care about them. As an athlete on the soccer field and on the track team, she often visited the zones at her school to study, read, and practice for college preps and write her college essay. The tutors, the facilitators, and coaches at Scholar Athlete cared for her, guided her, and mentored her. Sola worked so hard. And with the love, support, and steady encouragement of Scholar Athlete's team and others around her, 
she gained confidence and realized her true potential. And she applied for a college scholarship. Sola eventually became the first student from the Scholar Athlete Program to receive a full tuition scholarship. It's none other than Curry College. Sola's life was transformed because people loved her and cared about her and because she opened herself up to that love and caring. I'm proud to say that Sola is sitting out there today with her classmates, family and friends right now, wearing a cap and gown, ready to walk up to the stage and accept her degree in education. Sola, in your family, please stand and be recognized. I'm thrilled to say Sola's journey is far from over. She has big plans to earn a master's degree and complete the teacher residency program in Boston, well, she's, where she will complete the circle of caring by giving back to the community that helped pave her way to success. Sola is proof that love has a ripple effect that has no boundaries. When you change one life, you can change many others. These are stories of real people who had overcome real difficulties. And I know you have your stories of your own. We all do. And we all have our own crosses to bear and mountains to climb. But while we all face challenges, the times we live in today do not make it easy to face those challenges. At times, when we need love the most, we live in a culture of hate. You see it all around you. Social media, television, the tabloids. People define their success and keep score based on the number of people they bring down rather than lift up. Resist it. Ignore hate. Change the narrative and start today. You're probably thinking, this is where Fish tells us to change the world. I admit, that's a tall order. And I wouldn't put that kind of pressure on anybody. What I will tell you may be less idealistic, but no less important. My advice to the graduates is simple. And it's a four-letter word you'll never forget. No, it's not that one, okay? Here it is. Love. That's it. Love. <laughs> Surprise? Of course you are. Because no one uses that word anymore. It's too soft a word. In a world of catchy sound bites and slogans. Love is for the 60s, not for 2019. Love is a word you'd never use on your first date. It should be reserved for conversations behind closed doors, not in public forums like this one. Well, Graduates, don't be afraid. There are 7.5 billion human beings in this world. And we all have one thing in common, beyond the need for food, water, and shelter. We all just want to be loved by at least one person, just one. So answer the call. 
create a culture of love around you. Love is a big thing, but it can be shown in very small ways. Smile at someone you don't know. It won't cost you anything. Open the door for someone. Say please and thank you, like your mom and dad taught you. And when you're driving, pass up the urge to cut someone off, roll down your window, and practice your sign language. <laughs> Simply let them buy and wave and smile. Put your phones down and talk to people. And don't forget to listen. Be vulnerable and take risks with love. Believe in someone. Defend an underdog. Take a chance with somebody because you see them for who they really are. And by all means, don't feel pressure to change the world. Instead, change one person's world. Love is what makes us human. Love is contagious. Love keeps us alive and gives us hope. I know commencement speeches are supposed to address the biggest question of the day. They all are. But in these volatile and chaotic times, I admit, I don't know all the questions. But I'm absolutely certain love is the answer. Thank you, and God bless you all.